Hey, C. Sretsky here. As always, Canadian real estate market update with a particular focus on Vancouver. If you get any sort of value or entertainment on these videos, all I ask you to hit thumbs up and subscribe. Uh, questions, comments, put those below. Uh, there's not a whole lot happening in, in financial markets in the macro world right now. So, got to take a detour this week and get back to the roots on, on sort of Vancouver housing. Uh, obviously, a couple thoughts on you know the, the Canadian housing situation as a whole. Um, but I want to frame up this week's video with a picture or an image here of the basically the zoning maps uh, in the city of Vancouver. So, you know, I throw this this image up here. What you can see is the uh, everything in yellow. Uh, everything is in, in the yellow zoning that you can see here is basically states that you can only build a single family house and or a duplex. So essentially what it's saying is like single family only. Um, yes, I can understand people will say, hold on a minute, you know, Stanley Park's shaded yellow, you can't build in Stanley Park. Okay, well, Stanley Park is technically zoned RS1 single family residential. Again, we know there's no housing being built there, but, um, for the purpose of this video, just entertain this chart. Just look at basically the mass yellow um, and keep in mind now that you're only allowed to build single family homes in these yellow areas. And today, as it stands today, whether you look at the average sales price, the median sales price, or the benchmark price, which is the typical price of a, of a home in the city of Vancouver, it sits at 2.5 million. So you've got this basically this vast majority of the land in the city of Vancouver that is zoned where the entry point essentially is 2.5 million. So you can start to see that some of these, some of this housing issue or crisis is somewhat self-inflicted. And I would argue actually it's all self-inflicted because if we look at, um, you know, interest rates, for example, mortgage rates, uh, those are, essentially self-inflicted. It's a policy decision for the Bank of Canada to, to, to leave interest rates at zero. It's a policy rate for them to intervene in the bond market and to basically buy up government bonds to suppress yields and interest rates. So, you know, if we look today at, um, if we look today at the, you know, the five-year mortgage in Canada, you know, today it sits at, you know, the real interest rate on that mortgage is a negative 1.5%. Um, so basically, if you're taking on a five-year mortgage today, your, your your real cost of borrowing after you subtract inflation is negative 1.5%. So you can start to see where all this, uh, why all the, the wealth is accruing into the land because it's basically a form of savings. It's, it's, it's this hard asset. And again, I'm not gonna sit here and do this you know, pump and dump show trying to promote the Vancouver real estate market, but I like to provide at least an alternative way to try to look at things. It's extremely difficult to justify the, the price valuations here. But again, I look at this and say a lot of this is self-inflicted and I don't see any policymakers opting for or being able to actually implement any change. Um, and so you have this situation now where everyone goes, well, how can you afford these houses? I mean, it's $2.5 million. Well, what's happening now is we actually had some data that came out um, from Stats Canada. So basically what Stats Canada did is they went in and they... Uh, in 2018, this is the year of the, the study, they went in and went, they went into land titles data. So like, it's about as accurate as it's gonna get. Land title data is, is concrete, black and white. So um, it's, it's, it's good data. Um, they went in and they looked at all the, the property sales transfers, like any property that transferred hands in the official land titles office for 2018 uh, and what they're able to determine that in, in, in Metro Vancouver, um, 40%, 40, 40% 40 um, of all transactions were actually off market, uh, you know, for single family, off market transfers. Uh, and a lot of the times these transfers were done to, uh, the majority they said were done to uh, family members. So basically what it's saying here is that Okay, you've got you know your normal 
property transfer, right? So you got someone, someone puts the house on the MLS, the realtor sells it, transfers hands to the new owner, that's a sale. Now there's a lot of activity that doesn't happen on the MLS, it happens, you know, off market. It happens between, um, you know, mom and dad decide that they want to transfer a significant portion of the interest of that home to their son. So, you know, when they pass away, he's already got it, you don't have to go through probate, whatever, Some, something along those lines. And so what we can see here is that um, of all the, the transfers that happened, 40% of them in the single family market were done not on the MLS and they actually mostly involve transfers to relatives, uh, to family. So this is, uh, to me, basically what this tells you is you had this large wealth transfer where again, like if we look at that yellow map, and the typical home is 2.5 million and the average income in Vancouver is, you know, let's say if you're living in Vancouver, you know, income wise, I think those, these numbers are underreported, but let's call it 100 to 150, something more along those lines. You can't afford a $2.5 million house. So everyone says, well, how, do they, how are these guys saving for down payments, right? It takes 30 years to save for a down payment, assuming the, you know, the average income. But again, it's, it's, it's not really like what's actually happening. So you have all these, again, these PhD economists trying to come out and run these numbers. Like what you have created is you've created a financial system uh, that is driving basically these larger amounts of, of inequality, right? So you have this massive wealth transfer. So if you're born again into a wealthy family, the, um, you know, you're getting a transfer of an existing asset into your name or they're leveraging that asset to then take some of that equity. And, um, and I know people are gonna say, well, this, is, this sounds like a Ponzi scheme. And, and the reality is there's a lot of things in the financial market, a lot of things in this world are Ponzi schemes. I mean, the Canada pension plan is a Ponzi scheme. It relies on more and more people to contribute into it in order to fund uh, the existing liabilities. So it's a similar thing in the housing market. You need more and more entrants to come in to support the existing valuations. And so what policymakers, the, the option that I've seen them clearly take is less than we'll support the valuations. And I think their hopes, whether they tell you that or not, are that yes, these assets will maintain their value and will transfer them down that the parents will basically do a, a, a waterfall, so to speak, and it will rain down upon their children and we get to keep this going. This is, this is Keynes, but this is understand that you have to understand this is Keynesian economics. This is how the whole system has been derived. It's essentially, um, it's essentially like a Ponzi credit system in nature is, is in order to drive GDP growth, you have to basically create more credit. You have to basically issue new debt, new loans. So the majority of, of, of credit in the system, which we know as money, is actually created through uh, when commercial banks create and issue new loans, particularly in the form of mortgages, right? So uh, we need to continue to increase credit in order to basically boost uh, GDP or economic growth. And what you see is every time that credit slows down and contracts, the, the, the financial markets start to wobble and you go into this, you know, GDP starts to slow down. And everyone says, oh, we might be heading towards a recession. And then you ramp that credit up. And so the, the economy essentially ebbs and flows. Um, so I think that's an important thing I wanted to sort of you know, highlight today is that every every market has a, a unique dynamic to it. I mean, I'm certainly not the expert on, you know, the Toronto housing market, but what I can say is if I look at Vancouver as a whole, a lot of the, a lot of the, you know, pain in terms of affordability is, is again, self-inflicted. Um, you've got existing asset owners. Now, again, the thing about this is like, if you add this on even further, you could look at the, the BC provincial government's uh, property tra uh, property annual property tax deferral program, right? So if you're like a retired person, but you wanna sit in your single family house because you know that over time, they continue to print more money, your land mass and your, your zoning restricted, that your land value is gonna continue to accrue more value. So you might, be, you might not be able, uh, be able to afford to stay in your house, but don't worry, the BC government will allow you to stay in your house because we will let you defer the, uh, the annual property taxes at a rate of basically 1%, which is, again, real, 
uh, adjusted for real real terms as a negative two percent. So basically, the BC government essentially subsidizes uh, and encourages people to basically stay in their homes and not only stay in their homes but then transfer those homes uh, to the relatives. So again, it is a game of uh, sort of the has, the has nots, those that have the equity, those that have the assets, uh, I think certainly position them, their, their family um, in a better position than, than other people, right? I mean, if you're born into a family where you're, you know, your, your mom and dad were renting and were never able to build up that equity, well, that puts you in a much more difficult situation. So this is the, the things that I think policymakers are going to be grappling with moving forward. Um, and I think I want to highlight... Uh, one last thing, uh, which is a, is a great, uh, great chart here from my buddy Brian, um, which shows money velocity. Now people say, well, what is money velocity? Um, money velocity is essentially how many times one dollar will turn over and transfer hands. And so when you have a lot of, you know, economic productivity, new money that gets created, it gets turned over really quick, right? You go out, you, you know, you buy a shirt and then the person that, you know, received the money to buy a shirt then goes out and buys lunch and the person that received money to buy lunch goes out and buys a coffee and the money turns over. So money velocity is just calculating how many times that, you know, dollar in circulation ended up tr uh, flipping over and that basically shows the amount of velocity or GDP or sort of productivity so to speak right so what we can see here is money velocity um, continues to fall it's plummeting it's been plummeting not only in Canada but you know across basically the world and it's because what you have essentially is is these you know the global economy so to speak and obviously we're focusing on Canada here but um, these economies are becoming less and less productive. They, yes, we're you know sort of creating new money, um, but that money is going not going anywhere. It's not actually creating productivity. It's going into financial assets. And so what you see, right, is you see money velocity crashing, yet asset prices continue to go up. So the, basically, the new money that's essentially being created is simply just getting parked into assets such as real estate so that there is no turnover so the turnover continues to fall and uh, so this again comes into the to the whole big picture uh, where you have basically financialized the economy uh, and a lot of this has to do um, you know going back to really when uh, you, you know you got off the gold standard you opened up the credit spigots uh, you know, we go back to uh, Louis Ranieri who created the mortgage-backed security, uh, the ability of banks to basically bundle up mortgages, create new credit um, at an unprecedented pace, you know, de-risk uh, some, some of the, the banks that are issuing these loans. And, and it basically created, the, again, the financialization of housing, right? And now if we look at it today, you see a situation where, you know, housing isn't really viewed per se anymore and society isn't really viewed as like a place to live. Like uh, most people are now are looking at it as it's a, a financial investment. You know, real estate, every, every month people want to know what's happening in the market. Is it up 2%? Is it down? And, and you, know, you got the media covering it. You got people posting charts and graphs, you know, such as myself, because it has become this financialization. It's almost like the stock market. People are watching the valuations of their asset class, and people are, you know, going out and buying two, three, four homes uh, as a ways to generate and protect their capital. It's not no longer viewed, and that all comes down to the financialization um, of housing. And so, to sort of bring it all home. Uh, I think that we as people are ultimately a proxy of the the system that policymakers put in place. And so I have to laugh because I had, you know, the, the, some people, you know, on Twitter are going, uh, I said, you know, listen, the the Bank of Canada, for example, they cut interest rates to zero. They buy up all the government debt to push push those yields down they go out and even buy corporate debt i mean you have some central banks buying equity so you're pushing down all your sort of risk risk-free investments you know gic savings government bonds 
So you're intentionally you're intentionally punishing the savers. You're destroying them, really. Um, you know, with deep, real negative interest rates. Um, so you're you're intentionally pushing them out on the risk curve, basically telling them to go and buy things like equity, you know, stocks and and real estate, for example. And yet, and then people will come back and they're mad at the investors for you know buying up all the housing stock or the housing supply. You know, oh, these you know investors are buying up all these houses and they're competing with first-time home buyers. Ah, that's terrible. These damn investors. But not understanding that no, no, the investors were told what to do. They were nudged to go do this. It was the policy that was put in place. I mean, if you're an alternative, is is hey, you know. Uh, government bonds are yielding 4%. I can assure you there would be less people buying an investment condo. Um, but if you force people and you say, hey, listen, you know, real negative mortgage rates are negative 1.5%. We're actually going to basically pay you um, to go and take on a mortgage. Not only that, but that's based off the, the, the stated inflation rate, which today is about 3%. I mean, if you believe that inflation is three percent i mean some might argue that it's four five maybe six percent i mean i think it's higher than three so you actually have a real negative mortgage rate of probably arguably um negative three negative four on your on your mortgage rate so that's kind of how i'm trying to frame it up so you know the i think a lot of the anger unfortunately is actually misguided the anger should be placed at the system that has been put in place because people just react to the environment that is created or at least is enabling them. Um, and so that's kind of what I want to leave it with today. I think that uh, if you look at from the micro, the city of Vancouver, just from the zoning alone, uh, that is self-inflicted. The policy rates that we put in place, the policies aimed uh, at, for example, um, that we're incentivized to go and buy a primary residence. It's all tax-free, any sort of capital gain on that. Uh, you know, we know the tax rates in Canada are extremely punitive. Um, you know, if you're in the top tax bracket, you're just over 50%. Um, and so the incentive to park that into a larger house, primary residence is there. And so a lot of these issues in Canada are self-inflicted and keep that in mind as we ultimately head to a federal election here in the fall and all the BS that you're going to hear from these politicians promising you the world and changing very little once they're in power. So hope that helped. See you next week.